dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. It was the dividing line for a city, a continent, and a way of life. It was the Iron Curtain made of concrete, a 96-mile barrier that imprisoned over a million people for 28 years. At least 239 people died trying to get over, under, around, and through it. Now, the Berlin Wall on Modern Marvels. A scant decade and a half after its fall, there's not much left of the notorious Berlin Wall. The barrier that once split the world is now a relic, innocuous, decomposing, overrun with bushes and weeds. Guard towers that represented a bullet in the back to anyone trying to climb over the wall today stand quietly out of place in apartment courtyards and neighborhood parks. The longest surviving stretch of the wall a 4,200-foot run known as the East Side Gallery is more noted today for its art than its past. But in its time, the Berlin Wall stood as the most menacing, implacable, spookily evocative piece of infrastructure in the world. This was the central fault line of the Cold War, the dividing line between East and West, communism and capitalism, the two dominant and irreconcilable systems of our time. These were tectonic plates. They were moving towards each other. They were rubbing against each other in a way which is very difficult to comprehend. It wasn't a matter of moving from one country to the next. It was a matter of moving from one street corner to the next, and you move from one ideology to the next. Here is the world the ends here for capitalism. A better socialist society starts here. I was convinced of it. Ideology aside, the Berlin Wall was also a monumental, if bizarre, feat of construction and design. A 96-mile double barrier, complete with hundreds of watchtowers and a horrific death strip that aimed at nothing less than the absolute division of a major European capital. It was a poor country trying to construct the pyramids in the middle of a city. And they did it slightly on the cheap because they had to. They, they didn't have any alternative. But even so, they did a hell of a job in making it very, very difficult to get out of. Very difficult indeed. The roots and the desperate logic of the war go back to the end of World War II and the unraveling of relations between former allies. At war's end, Germany was divided into four zones, one each for the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. The capital city of Berlin lay 110 miles inside the Soviet zone, and it too was divided in four, one sector for each of the Allies. The Soviets, who took Berlin after weeks of fierce fighting, laid claim to the largest sector, East Berlin which occupied about 40% of the city and contained 1.1 million inhabitants. The US, Britain and France had control over West Berlin and its 2.2 million citizens. The 200-year-old Brandenburg Gate was one of the few structures to survive the war. It stood at the dividing line between the Soviet and Allied sectors, between East and West Berlin. Post-war Berlin was a wasteland and refugees poured from the east into the west, where reconstruction, fueled by the Marshall Plan, was dramatic. To staunch the flow, the Soviets imposed a land blockade around West Berlin in 1948, designed to starve the Allies out and bring the entire city under Soviet control. <laughs> 
It was foiled in dramatic fashion by an American airlift. Non-stop sorties, one every two minutes, 24 hours a day, supplied all the needs of the city for 11 months. The Soviets finally lifted the blockade on May 12, 1949. By now, the former allies were bitterly at odds. And yet, despite political differences, the border between East and West Berlin was surprisingly open and free. The 800-year-old city shared a common infrastructure. Everything from mail delivery to subways was jointly operated, and some 60,000 East Berliners worked on the West Side. That was the real problem in Berlin, that it was an open city and people could be spot-checked by the police, but they couldn't really get a handle on people crossing between the two halves of the city. Over the next decade, the refugee problem worsened. East Germany was losing over 100,000 people a year, three quarters of them through Berlin. And Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was renewing demands for Allied troops to leave the West. The regime finds out in 1958 that they're actually losing more doctors in a year than they can actually train in a year. So they're beginning to go backwards. In 1961, when East Germany was starting literally to melt away to the West because the West was prosperous, the East German government examined the options, and there was only one option, and that was to build a wall to stop them going. There was nothing else they could do. And yet, what happened at midnight, August 13th, 1961, caught everyone by surprise. In the history of the planet, no one had ever thought of trying to forcibly divide a city the size of Philadelphia in two with a wall. There was a huge CIA presence in West Berlin looking for what the East German regime would have to do to staunch the flow of the refugees. They concluded that bisecting the city was impossible. This was not an option. To take an old-fashioned, intertwined, unified, European capital city that's been there for a thousand years and split it down all boundary lines. Can't be done. Codenamed Wall of China by the East Germans, the top secret operation aimed to establish a 27 mile barrier between East and West Berlin and a 69 mile barrier between West Berlin and East Germany. Foreigners would still be allowed across the border through a handful of checkpoints. But East Germans, especially East Berliners, would not. The operation, conceived by East German President Walter Ulbricht and approved by Khrushchev, was launched at midnight Sunday morning to catch the city off guard. Within 24 hours, barbed wire had been nailed onto concrete posts through 5.16 miles of central Berlin. 67 of the 81 crossing points between the east and west were sealed off. Movement through the remaining checkpoints was strictly controlled. I listened to the news at 7 a.m., August 13th, and I immediately woke my brother. We then took our bicycle and drove along the borders and saw how the concrete poles were inserted into the asphalt with the help of jackhammers. Barbed wire barriers were built and a lot of military men carrying weapons, and it looked like war. The first phase of locking down the city was the most dangerous. Thousands of border guards and East German police, backed by East German army tanks, were sent into the streets, along with 25,000 civilian reservists who had been wakened by the police at 2 in the morning and deployed with guns and barbed wire. No one had been told a word about the operation in advance, and no one knew how anyone, including the people of East Berlin, would react. If the people had rioted, they were in deep trouble. If the soldiers had said, we're not manning this, they would have been in deep trouble. It was a desperate throw. Such a thing had never been tried. There were no rehearsals, nothing. When it was clear that there was not going to be an uprising, East German and Soviet officials held their breath over an even bigger question. How would the West, in particular the United States, react? West Berlin was in an uproar, with mass demonstrations and some rioting. But it was the U.S. that Ulbricht and Khrushchev were worried about. The East German authorities are terrified that the West might actually respond, that might be a war, so that they're being very careful not to provoke the West. And there are orders that if they shoot, they shouldn't shoot so that any bullets enter 
West Berlin. They can only shoot parallel to the wall or back into territory. In Washington, President Kennedy closely monitored events. But as the days went by, it became clear that as long as the East left West Berlin alone, he was not going to take military action. The erection of the wall was politically accepted by the Western Allies because this reduced or even eliminated a source for future conflict. Here, the frontier was set and no more people moving uh, from East Germany to West Germany, East Berlin to West Berlin, and creating some kind of, uh, of uh, um, something which you could not calculate. So in some senses, the building of the wall solved the Berlin crisis, and all sides heaved a huge sigh of relief about that. They wouldn't say that in public, but that's what a lot of Western politicians thought at the time. After three days, Khrushchev and Ulbricht concluded that the U.S. would not strike back. On August 16th, they issued orders to put up permanent barriers. Soldiers and workers began hammering together what would become known as the First Generation Wall, a hodgepodge built up out of whatever materials lay at hand. Stone and brick were used to divide East and West Berlin. Barbed wire and watchtowers would lock off the rural border between West Berlin and East Germany. Western analysts puzzled over how the East Germans managed to hide the resources needed to erect a 100-mile wall. But the answer was staring everyone in the face. East Berlin was a building site because we'd bombed it flat. All they had to do was go along to the building sites and commandeer whatever they wanted in terms of concrete slabs, breeze blocks, bricks, anything they could lay hands on. A very crude, simple structure. So crude that it was laid without a foundation. The wall's own weight would have to suffice to hold it in place. And so extensive that materials that have been earmarked for the construction of 20,000 apartment units were used to build the wall. The makeshift primitive look of the structure, barbed wire visible everywhere, nakedly announced its intent to lock in anyone who might be thinking of leaving, including the men who built it. I remember interviewing one of them and asked him how he actually felt about this. And he said that deep down, you know, this really was gut-wrenching work, that he really felt he was walling off part of his family from his other relatives. On the other hand, many in the East were relieved to see the government finally taking action. There was widespread resentment against the young professionals, trained at state expense, who had fled to the West. Moreover, World War II had exposed the horrors of German fascism, and there was a strong desire to take the country in a new direction. Many felt that the wall gave the socialist system a chance. The Berlin War had a special meaning concerns saving the socialist bloc. It was a necessity for us, because uh, there was an immense rich world against us. Uh, and we had to overwhelm it. But stopping the flow of refugees with a wall would prove to be a difficult and bloody undertaking. Historically, monumental walls have been few. Hadrian's Wall, marking the edge of the Roman Empire. The 1,500-mile Great Wall of China. The Maginot Line a wall of fortifications designed to keep the Germans out of France after the First World War. And the Atlantic Wall, put up by the Germans during World War II to block an invasion across the English Channel. But the Berlin Wall was different. Officially, it was called an anti-fascist protective barrier. But it was obvious from the start that its purpose was not to keep enemies out, but to keep the 1.1 million people of East Berlin in. Its impact on the city was immediate and profound. Following the post-World War II border between East and West Berlin, the wall blindly zigzagged through the city, cutting through streets, railroad tracks, bridges, and whatever else lay in its path. Fifteen public transportation routes that had tied East and West together were abruptly abandoned, creating eerie ghost stations through which no trains stopped. 
innumerable families and friends were splintered and torn apart. You had these very, very tragic situations where a couple would get married in the West and would go to a predetermined point at the wall, sometimes the women wearing their wedding dresses, so that the, the relatives in the East could wave to them, but even that was forbidden. And they built the wall to such a height that people couldn't see over it, and they bricked up the windows, and it was an offence to wave to people in the West. Some of the most harrowing dramas took place on Bernauer Street where a long row of apartment buildings stood on the exact border between East and West Berlin. People living in these houses, when they looked out of the window, their head was in the west side and their foot still in the east. So it was here on this side, it was very simple to escape in the first hours of the wall. Some desperate residents jumped into the nets of West Berlin firemen who encouraged them from the street below. At least two elderly people died when they missed the nets. The most dramatic incident involved 77-year-old Frieda Schultz, who was caught in a tug of war that epitomized the city's plight, with East German police trying to drag her back through the window and West Germans trying to pull her down. Authorities in the East moved quickly to seal off Bernauer Street evicting 2,000 people from 87 buildings on September 20th, then bricking up 1,253 windows and doors. The buildings were eventually demolished to make room for the wall. Bernauer Street wasn't the only weak link in the first generation barrier. Hundreds of people made it through poorly guarded sections of barbed wire, which was used in place of stone in less populated parts of the city and on the rural border between East Germany and West Berlin. Others smashed vehicles, including this homemade tank, through thin barriers of concrete. This section of the wall was knocked out by a truck in 1962. Border guards were among the early escapees. 85 guards fled to the west in the first six weeks of the wall including one who was dramatically captured on camera as he tossed away his gun and jumped across a fence. Rudy Turo was a border guard from 1955 until he made a run for it with three civilians on February 21st, 1962. Wearing his sergeant's uniform, he pulled rank on his fellow guards, ordering them to go to a different checkpoint. He then led the refugees to the wall Things went well until one of them got tangled in barbed wire. In this moment, at that moment, some other border guards who saw us immediately used their weapons, and I was forced to shoot continuously above their heads. And then we escaped into a house in West Berlin, and we were freed by American soldiers. Not all escapes were successful. The first person to be shot to death while crossing the wall was a 24-year-old tailor named Gunter Litvin. Litvin was killed on August 24th while trying to swim to the west across the Humboldt Canal. I went home on the 26th at 3 in the morning where I found my mother crying in the apartment, which had been completely taken apart. Nobody said that my brother had been shot. We learned that in the evening during the program of the Berlin TV station SFB. I went to forensic medicine in order to find my brother and identify him. I broke the coffin open and saw that my brother seemed to be completely unhurt. He had only a bandaid on the tip of his chin where the bullet had come out. Litvin's death sent a chilling message to everyone in Berlin. But it was another death a few months later that shocked the city to its core. 18-year-old Peter Fechter was shot in the back while scaling the wall that used to stand right here, just in front of Checkpoint Charlie. For over an hour, he cried for help, but was left to die. Both the American troops and the East German guards were afraid the other side might shoot if they tried to help. He was lying at the foot of this wall, crying out, help me, help me. And they, nobody could help him. They had to order three soldiers, and it took a long time to get the three soldiers there. 
who went to retrieve him and carried him away like a, like a rag doll. So this was at least a psychological signal for all those who had in their minds to cross the wall. Very risky. Don't do that. If individual deaths were horrifying, the wall engendered other dramas that were nerve-wracking for the world. None more so than a showdown at Checkpoint Charlie between Soviet and American tanks that began on October 25, 1961, just two months after the wall was installed. Under the World War II Four Powers Agreement, the U.S. had absolute right of movement into East Berlin, but suddenly, East Berlin began to contest that right and would not let American jeeps pass without showing papers. In the jittery context of the Cold War, it was just the kind of incident that could spin out of control, especially with 30 U.S. and 32 Soviet tanks facing each other, engines running, cannons loaded. The world was genuinely frightened. This was the Cuban Missile Crisis, but 40 yards apart. The worst case scenario was that somebody would lose a nerve. A soldier with a gun in a building would lose his nerve and a tank would fire and they're firing on us, we're firing on them, and it goes all the way back. The crisis ended after three days when Khrushchev ordered the Soviet tanks to slowly back away and the East Germans once again allowed US soldiers to move freely in and out of Berlin. Despite such showdowns, the wall continued to evolve. In 1963, the East Germans began working on a second generation structure made up of stacked concrete slabs that could hold up better against cars and trucks. And they methodically set about trying to plug any weak spots in the barrier. They really go over the whole wall. The leadership, Honecker, and the generals literally pace out the wall. They walk along every step of the way. They check out the sewers, they check out the rivers. Grills underwater are put in the rivers to stop swimmers getting through. Barriers are put in the, in the underground sewers. And by about 1963, the only real way to get across is by building tunnels. And later on, they got much more sophisticated. They had underground listening equipment where they could listen for tunneling. They would build counter tunnels, which would actually collapse the other tunnels. By mid-1963, a solid wall made up of 7,874 cubic yards of concrete separated East and West Berlin. Barbed wire fencing, anchored by 116 wooden watchtowers, controlled the longer rural border between East Germany and West Berlin. A 100-yard border zone was added to the entire wall in June of 1963. Anyone entering the zone without proper authorization was arrested. Although he had no intention of going to war over the wall, President Kennedy did buoy the spirits of West Berlin when he visited the city on June 26, 1963. 1.5 million Berliners, nearly 70% of the population, turned out for his speech. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word Ich bin ein Berliner. I think many West Berliners were extremely touched that Kennedy was prepared to come and show his solidarity. And that was, if you like, a, a political statement. It meant I am prepared to defend democracy in the West. But Kennedy's visit also made it clear that the wall was a fact of life that was not about to disappear. Indeed, in purely physical terms, the Berlin Wall was only just beginning to take shape. From a design point of view, the bizarre challenge of the Berlin Wall was figuring out how to create a barrier that really could keep the 1.1 million people of East Berlin trapped inside. No single wall could do that, at least not one that the East Germans with their scarce resources could afford. Instead, they devised a wall system that used layer upon layer of surveillance, detection, obstruction, and control. By 1965, the wall was actually two walls, each 10 to 12 feet high, 
made of either concrete or wire mesh fence and separated by 30 to 100 yards, depending on terrain. In between was the death strip in which most would-be escapees were caught or killed. Here, the devil was truly in the details. Anyone who managed to scale the inner wall had to then get past a six-foot wire mesh fence, topped with rows of barbed wire and rigged with alarms. Beyond that lay landmines and self-activating firing mechanisms triggered by tripwire, which were deployed in rural areas. Those trying to escape by vehicle had to plow through upturned railroad tracks and an anti-tank ditch, strategically spaced watchtowers, high-intensity searchlights, concrete bunkers, and armed patrols added to the morbid excess of urban lockdown. Both inner and outer wall were painted bright white, against which fugitives could be more easily detected. The land between the walls was chemically sprayed throughout the year. There was a space of about 50, maybe 100 meters, which was kept clear of any vegetation. Berlin is built on sand, so it was very sandy, and it would be raked clean every day to show any footprints that showed up. Dogs provided yet another layer of detection. The dogs were tethered on stakes on long leads so they could roam. The leashes extended from one dog to the next to the point where they were virtually nose to nose but couldn't attack each other, but were so close that nobody could run between them. Meanwhile, the wall itself continued to evolve. In 1968, the old improvised barrier was taken down and replaced with a third generation wall a, quote, modern border, made up of prefabricated sections and anchored by steel beams. Guards, of course, were the key to the whole system. 8,000 border guards were carefully selected for their ideological reliability. Berliners were excluded because it was thought they might balk at shooting other Berliners. Those with relatives in the West were also disqualified. Guarding the border was both tedious and nerve-wracking with long shifts, harsh conditions, and disturbing orders. In the unit where I was deployed, the morale was devastated. Many soldiers had to serve for 12 hours, and the discipline was disastrous. They drank a lot of alcohol because a lot of comrades did not agree with the use of weapons, in other words, with the orders to fire. They were generally armed with Kalashnikov, semi-automatic rifles, and uh, very soon after the wall went up, there was a so-called shoot-to-kill order. And it's quite clear from the internal orders, which Honecker personally supervised, that guard, border guards were expected to shoot as a last resort, but they were expected to shoot and not to miss. Indeed, East German President Walter Ulbricht himself presented this flag to the guards who killed Peter Fechter, honoring them as the best border unit of 1962. Walter Ulbricht went to the border guards to say thank you, thank you for a dead one at the wall. He had a special flag produced with his own portrait on it. We will gain victory with Walter Ulbricht. When you look at it from the East German point of view, they had to motivate those people. Otherwise, uh, they would flee themselves. And, well, uh, at least uh, several ones have, have done so. To reduce the risk of escape, guards were always paired up, strangers controlling each other. Fully one-fifth of the guards belonged to the Stasi, East Germany's notorious secret police. So there were these strange feeling out conversations between two of them who didn't quite trust each other and didn't know if the other one was secret service or would report on them. So you have two people not trusting the other one, looking out across possibly 10 or 15 yards to a wall and then the west with this galaxy of neon. The watchtowers were Spartan. No toilets, no cooking facilities, no heat. 
Trips to the bathroom and shift changeovers were carefully coordinated. To replace them, a jeep came along with two replacements. And one of the replacements went up to the watchtower and replaced one who went down. And the second one went up from the jeep and replaced the one who went down and they drove off. So that at no stage were they off balance. Adding to the queasy strain of the job was the fact that it was dangerous. 16 border guards were shot to death while serving at the Berlin Wall. And this became, if you like, part of the propaganda in East Germany that these were the guards of peace at the border between two worlds and monuments would actually be set up to the guards. But after the end of the war, it was discovered that about half of these men were actually killed by their own troops in firefights where one guard was trying to escape from his fellow and decided to make sure and put a bullet in his fellow guard. And that was something which East Berliners did not know at the time. Something else that no one knew, of course, was that the Berlin Wall, a seemingly permanent piece of the Cold War landscape, was living on borrowed time. By the 1970s, East Germany had evolved into one of the strongest economies in Eastern Europe. The turnaround was due in large part to the stabilizing influence of the wall, which effectively cut off the brain drain of refugees and kept the social system intact. But rising stature in the world community made East Germany increasingly sensitive about its most famous and embarrassing piece of infrastructure. In 1975, the East Germans began constructing a fourth generation wall, a makeover designed to give the barrier a cleaner, more respectable look. It was also designed to make the wall even tougher to breach. Dozens of East Berliners were still trying to escape each year, usually at checkpoints with false papers, but sometimes through the wall. The latest renovation would make that more difficult. 45,000 easy to install, weather and pollution resistant, L-shaped segments replaced the old wall that separated the two Berlins. The bottom of the L extended horizontally more than six feet in the ground to make the wall impregnable to cars and trucks. Each segment was 3.9 feet wide and 11.8 feet high. The top of the wall featured a new refinement, a rounded crown made of sewage piping that made it even harder to scale. It was very difficult to go over. And some tried it from, from the west even to, as a provocation. But, but they fall, fall down because it's very difficult to stay on the wall. And in this sense, it was perfected. And of course, the material of the wall. When you look at it, you can see it right now at the, at the remains of the wall. There was steel in it and concrete, which was very, very tight. So it, it would even resist, I think, a, a light tank. The impregnability of the fourth generation wall was tested by the border guards themselves. Mock-ups of the wall were built at their training barracks southeast of Berlin. And initially they would try to defeat the wall. They would try to pole vault it. They would try to blow it up. And in one instance, they used an old T-34 tank to try and ram the wall. And they were always defeated. The cleaner looking revised wall may have been bad news for people who wanted to get out but it did have a silver lining, at least for some in the West. This is the wall which became a gift to Western graffiti artists. It was just so smooth and irresistible that they would cover it in graffiti and at regular intervals, the East German border guards would go out through the little secret doors they had in the wall and respray it white, but within weeks, the thing would be this multicolored giant paint board, really. The image makeover continued into the 1980s. One by one, the more visually disturbing components of the wall system were eliminated. The tank barriers made of upright railroad tracks and the automatic firing mechanisms. But East Germany had no intention of doing away with the wall. Indeed, the government proudly celebrated the 25th birthday of its anti-fascist protective barrier in 1986.
At the same time, it began drawing up plans for a minimally manned 21st century version of the structure, dubbed Border Wall 2000. Plans were being made to use microwaves, to use electronic technology, to use heat sensors to detect escapers. I think this would have cost the state an enormous amount of money, but given past experience, the East Germans would have spent that money. If you seek peace... As it turned out, they never got the chance. Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall. By the time President Reagan made this appeal in Berlin in 1987, forces were already in motion that would bring the wall and the division of the world that it represented crashing down. When Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev announced a new policy of perestroika, or reform, he made it clear that the Soviet Union would not intervene militarily in Eastern Bloc affairs. Protesters throughout East Germany, and especially East Berlin, began demanding radical changes, including the right to free movement and travel. As demonstrations grew increasingly massive and defiant, the aging East German Politburo finally began to think about taking down the wall. It was the beginning of some realistic consideration of what is happening around us. But it was also too late to, uh, by changing some accents of the communist policy, to gain uh, the trust of uh, uh, the people. On November 9, 1989, Gunter Schabowski made this stunning announcement. All travel restrictions between East and West Berlin were over. The wall had come down. Ironically, for a system in which so much was controlled, this momentous decision was announced without ever informing the border guards, who were immediately swamped with people trying to get to the West. It was a very dangerous misunderstanding. The soldiers did not know and trembled, what, what shall we do? And some will say, go back, that's a mob, and they will shoot. And the real wonder is that, that it did not happen. Fortunately, in the chaos of November 9th, no names were added to the list of those shot and killed trying to get through the Berlin Wall. After nearly three decades, Hundreds of killings, thousands of escapes, and the occasional nuclear scare, the Berlin Wall had finally come down. For many who had grown up with the wall, it was hard to believe that it was really history. One way to make sure was by attacking the wall, physically, as thousands of Berliners gleefully did. It was not just something to, to take home, something which would see history maybe a year or two later. But it was also, I think, some kind of accumulated frustration, accumulated anger that led a lot of West Berliners to make their own contribution to get the wall down. Official demolition of the 96-mile double wall began on June 13, 1990. It was a major undertaking, with 45,000 2.7-ton segments, 127.5 kilometers of electrical fencing, and 302 watchtowers. Ironically, it fell to the border guards to bring it down. It was constructed not to be destroyed, and now it had to be destroyed. So uh, that was the last job of the border guards that they had to take care of the remains of the wall. After they finished their job, there was nothing to do for them anymore. Most of the wall was crushed and recycled as pavement. Some 250 of the more brilliantly painted segments were carefully removed by the German state and sold at auction in Monte Carlo, generating over $1 million. Large chunks were sent to bastions of the West as trophies of the Cold War, the CIA, the Reagan Library. Other segments wound up in curious places, an outdoor cafe on 53rd Street in Midtown Manhattan, and a urinal in the Main Street Station Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas.
components of the wall system were also sold off, including the vicious guard dogs, hundreds of them, which had been trained to turn on their own handlers if they tried to make a break. They turned out to be so docile that people bought them as pets. The killer dogs turned out to be wonderful, wonderful pets who didn't molest burglars or anything. The fall of the wall dramatically changed the look of Berlin. Incredibly, the death strip across the heart of the city was now choice real estate, and developers moved in. Potsdamerplatz, which in 1989 looked like this, is now a favorite corporate address, home to Daimler-Benz and Sony. Tourists once again roam around the Brandenburg Gate, where for 28 years, a stroll could have cost them their lives. And in a mingling of grotesqueries, the former death strip will become the new home for a World War II Holocaust memorial, a vast monument designed to look like an off-kilter cemetery. The only preserved section of the death strip is on Bernauer Street, where a memorial has been set up with tiny slits in the East Berlin side of the wall that afford a glimpse of what was once no man's land. The wall itself is almost entirely gone, except for the East Side Gallery and a few remnants that have been salvaged or that nobody bothered to tear down. A line of stone traces its former path, zigzagging through Berlin like footprints from the past. The past lingers less visibly in the ongoing attempt to sort through questions of guilt and responsibility for the killings that took place at the wall. Who is responsible? Is it the people who pulled the triggers, the ordinary guards at the wall, or was it their political bosses? At the end of the day, some of the political leaders did actually have to serve a prison sentence. In the cases of the trigger pullers, this was not something which the authorities could turn a blind eye to, so that trials were held, but generally the charge was one of manslaughter, not of murder, and in nearly all cases, a suspended sen sentence was given. East German President Ernst Honecker was put on trial in 1993, but released for ill health. He died in exile in Chile the next year. Gunter Schabowski, who served on the Politburo between 1984 and 1989, when three people were killed at the wall, was sentenced to three years. He is the only high-ranking member of the East German government to take responsibility for the deaths. I was a member of the highest power and just to ignore the facts that people shall be killed if they wanted without any criminal intention just to leave the country. I'm also responsible for this. The concept of the wall is control. So if you control everything, you solve problems. This concept leads to death. And it took all your resources. So in a way, this wall building strikes back. And here you can learn from a, from a country who was very perfect in doing it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all.